All right, good afternoon. Uh, I'm going to be talking about one very important stakeholder in this process of a sustainable development goes, namely about us, about the human population on this planet. It is us who have caused many of the problems that we are dealing with, and it is our future human well-being. That's actually the reason why we are concerned. Well, uh, population growth uh, is called by some people as sort of the elephant in the room in the SDGs because it is nowhere explicitly mentioned, although many people think it is one of the main threats, one of the main drivers uh, that makes it more difficult um, to solve the problems. It's through the number of consumers and their impact on the environment at a given level of per capita consumption, more, pe more people mean more problems. Um, it, also, the population growing rapidly makes it more difficult to expand the social services that we value so much, like education, health care, and reducing poverty. And uh, through more people with higher vulnerability, uh, being exposed to natural disasters and other environmental chains, particularly in the context of climate change, it's more difficult uh, to uh, assure the resilience of this larger number of people. Uh, and last not least, uh, this uh, may be an increasing threat uh, and likelihood of conflict and even uncontrolled mass migration, something that at least in Europe is a major concern these days. So these are some of the issues uh, why population matters really for our future human well-being. But despite of the fact that it's not explicitly targeted, uh, there are several of the sustainable development goals that directly matter for population and influence future population trends. So under the, uh, the goal three on health, uh, there is explicit mentioning also of reproductive health services, including family planning. Uh, child mortality is a very important target to significantly lower it. And very important, as I will now demonstrate also, are the education-related targets about universal primary and secondary education, because universally uh, more educated women have fewer children, and particularly in developing countries. So we have the ASA have been producing world population scenarios, not only by age and sex, as conventional demography does, but also by level of educational attainment. And you see here in colors, education. So a red means uh, no education, never been to school, then the light red, incomplete primary, up to the dark red, which dark blue, which is a complete tertiary education. And you see, uh, in 1970, really, more than half of the world population had very, very low or no education altogether. So the blue area has been expanding, and that's the good news. Also, in the future, much of the population growth that we see in the future is an increasing number of people with higher education. But still, there are segments, particularly in Africa and parts of South Asia, with very low or no education. So that's the middle of the road scenario. And uh, as you see, the SSP1 and 3, these are more optimistic and pessimistic scenarios, and I'm going to tell you later more about this. Also, you see the UN population projections, the most recent ones, are somewhat higher, and part of the reason is that they are not explicitly addressing this issue of improving educational attainment uh, where women with more education will have fewer children. Okay, so adding education to age and sex, and I'm not going to go into any details, really matters for two main reasons. The one is uh, that, um, as I said, the uh, more educated people do not only have uh, fewer birth rates, but they live longer and they have also different migration patterns. So explicitly focusing on this really changes the population forecast. But of course, education also is a crucial determinant of individual empowerment or human capital, as the economists call it, and therefore it's a key driver of socioeconomic development, ranging from public health uh, to economic growth, even the quality of institutions, democracy, we've shown to be very highly dependent on the uh, education of the broad segments of population, and ultimately also adaptive capacity uh, to already unavoidable climate change. Just to illustrate this a bit, one of my favorite pictures is this adding color to the age pyramid. So this is the example of Singapore in 1970. So the red again is uh, women and men without any education, a dark blue tertiary. Uh, you see, um, Singapore in the 50s was a miserable place. It was desperately poor, completely uneducated, malaria-ridden. And then uh, early in the 60s, they really started massively to invest in education, still at a poor state. 
And now you see a population here where the older ones above age 40 are essentially all uneducated. They cannot even read and write, whereas the younger generation gets better educated. And now this process, what I would call demographic metabolism, intergenerational change, moving up the age pyramid, shows how in 1980, 1990, the young population really got much better educated. And this was the time when public health improved, malaria was eradicated, and in particular, this phenomenal economic growth happened when these highly educated young people came into the main working ages. But at the same time, the elderly are still uneducated, were still uneducated then and are still today. So 2000, now uh, young people in Singapore are already better educated than young people in Europe and the US. 2010, and of course we can continue this in the future. This is now under the middle of the road scenario, Singapore 2020. Now you see, of course, more educated women have much fewer children, so you have significant population aging here. But since the population is so much better educated, and this is the same question we're facing in Europe or in the US, uh, can the better educated young population compensate in terms of higher productivity uh, for their smaller numbers? Okay, uh, we've put uh, much of this together uh, in, a, in a framework, really, uh, to view the future of the world population, uh, also by human capital, and see what education by itself makes uh, to world population growth. And uh, here we showed sort of two alternative scenarios. They have identical sets of birth rates for women by different education level, but we only have different education scenarios. So here, this is the most pessimistic, constant enrollment numbers, no new schools being built. And you see the world population increasing very rapidly, hitting already the 10 billion mark by the middle of the century. The same education-specific fertility rates, but much stronger efforts in education. Really, every country in Africa essentially launching something that's similar to what we've seen in Singapore or Korea. And you see many more educated, and already by the mid-century, more than one billion less on this planet. So then about the effect, the interactions, the synergies between education, health, and uh, population growth. Um, now, what about economic growth? With the same... Uh, age-specific education patterns that we've reconstructed for all countries of the world, we could now newly address this main and important economic question, what are the key drivers of international economic growth? Economists have struggled with this. Theory tells, yes, human capital is the key driver, should be the key driver, but their economic growth regressions didn't show it consistently because they had the wrong education variables. They just took the mean years of schooling for all the age groups together. Once we differentiate by age, uh, as I showed in Singapore, the specific age groups coming into the decisive ages, then it comes out beautifully clear that indeed education is the key driver of economic growth. And we have a significant underfinding that you see here on the right-hand side, that universal primary education is not enough to get poor countries out of poverty, it really requires the education, secondary education of broad segments of the population. And this was in 2008 when the Millennium Development Goals still were focusing only on universal primary education. And therefore, we are very happy to see now that the 2015 Sustainable Development Goal 4 uh, talks about quality primary and secondary education for all girls and boys. Now, uh, education also is not only a driver of many of the good things, a determinant, it also helps to protect us. So here what is plotted is sort of the circular thing. You have the human population consuming, causing greenhouse gas emissions, contributing to climate change. But it was mentioned just before uh, that also innovation and technological improvements may have big role in mitigation of climate change, but this also has to be invented by the human beings, by us, and it depends on our uh, education, our skills, and the, the institutions that we have. So these both avenues uh, influence climate change, but then there is already unavoidable climate change that will affect our future well-being, and therefore the notion of differential vulnerability is quite important. We are not all equally affected. Some people are affected more than others depending, of course, on the place where they live, but even at a given location, it depends on age, on the gender of the person, and also very much on the education level we could show. And uh, we did a global analysis of this, and you, you know there's this green climate fund that should uh, be up to $100 billion per year. And the good question is, what will happen with this money? So far, most of the money is going into infrastructure, uh, concrete projects in the dual sense of the, of the word, they're building walls and so on. 
And uh, we showed actually universal education is a more meaningful, at or at least an additional important investment. And Science Magazine put here the subtitle that we didn't put, but it upset some engineers. But I'm always saying we are not saying that they should not get money, but they should not get all the money. Educators, increasing the human capital also should be funded. OK, actually, I'm coming to the conclusion. Uh, YASA, together with many other institutions in the world, has been developing this new set of global scenarios, the so-called SSPs, Shared Socioeconomic Pathways, that captures both uh, the socioeconomic challenges to climate change mitigation as well as adaptation on the other axis. So along the diagonal, you have the SSP 1, 2, 3, going from a rapid social development, sustainability, uh, to a stalled development and fragmentation. And we've recently, in a major book uh, that was dedicated to Nathan Kiefitz, who was the leader of the World Population Program in the 1990s, after uh, being Professor Emeritus from Harvard University, who really developed these methods of multidimensional demography that we applied now to all countries in the world. So this is the SSP2, in a way, the middle of the roast, if you want, the most likely scenario. Here we see a peaking of world population in the 2060s, 70s, around 9.4 billion, and then slightly declining. And you see also a, a very broad uh, expansion of the more educated population. And that is likely because in almost all countries today, uh, the younger ones are better educated than the older ones. But this is not granted. This is the stalled development scenario, very little improvement in education and the world population going up to more than 12 billion. It's going to be a very, very difficult situation on this planet. And we can have the SSB1, which is a rapid development scenario, peaking earlier and even better educated. Now, uh, we are just at the moment in an exercise to translate the development goals into one S SDG population scenario. And the outcome is very close to SSP1. So if the, SS, S, the sustainable development goals are indeed realized, we may see a future like this. Thank you very much. Thank you.